Hey guys, Crypto Dad here. Thanks for joining me on the Saturday night live stream live from Michigan where you can throw out questions and I'll do my best to get them answered. We'll talk about Bitcoin, we'll talk about the news, we'll talk about altcoins, gonna move some crypto around for you guys. And as always, I'll do my best to get to your questions and see if we can't solve your problems here live. Um, here with the rig and uh, my Bitcoin logo behind me. Um, I usually have that little uh, flash screen uh, for a few minutes uh, as people are joining. And I try not to do anything like turn on my mic or flip cameras or do anything weird. But I did unplug my mouse and plug in my ledger so that I could um, enter my pin. So that's what you guys were hearing with the doodle doodle. <laughs> try to avoid that kind of stuff. But uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm gonna try to get through the news uh, pretty quick and I'm gonna focus tonight on your questions as much as possible. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff lined up to do like I do on some other nights. I'm just kinda taking it easy tonight. But I would like to just kind of see if I can answer questions to the best of my ability. Let's go over to the screen. I want to welcome everyone that's here. Uh, so we need to flip screens. I didn't check that one earlier. Come on, baby. Yeah, so I just double click here. And what's the screen I want? This one. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Kenny was here early. Mr. Miski, Diesel Kane, thank you. Diesel, I believe, was here on Wednesday as well. Uh, you've got a pretty good attendance record. Uh, Andreas, it's nice to have you here again live. Wonderful. Mark Slosberg, always from um, Slovakia. It seems like you're making my Saturday night live stream a regular thing. I appreciate that. Taking Care of Business was here with a flurry of questions talking about anonymity. We're going to talk a little bit about anonymity in that first story about uh, the uh, Satoshi emails that have uh, surfaced recently. Uh, some original emails between, uh, and I can't remember his name, but um, on th some of the um, early chats with the uh, original, or bleh, with Satoshi, the guy that uh, created Bitcoin, or people, we're not sure if it's one person or many. We'll see. Zach C is here. Thank you for being here. Haven't seen that movie yet, but I saw it on uh, in my prime. Um, I believe you still have to buy it or rent it. Uh, I've got like four or five different <laughs> services. Usually we'll poke around and see if we can find a movie that on uh, prime that's for free, you know, like if it's on Hulu or uh, Peacock or Max and stuff. Sometimes stuff that's for rent is uh, included with our other services. But I'll probably check out that movie. Uh, P. Whistle, thanks for being here. Decided to give up ice skating tonight and, stand, and uh, to listen to me. Uh, I'm flattered. I wouldn't pass up ice skating. Haven't been in a while, though. I don't know. <laughs> hello from Colorado. E. Poston, good to have you. Simona Mullen, hello. Good to have you. Daniel Berry, Sports Highlights, good to have you. Uh, Gregory Wheeland, uh, Scott, good to have you tonight, Scott, as always. Uh, the fees on Lightning are so high, what's the point? Yeah, um, the thing about Lightning is getting your Bitcoin into a Lightning node uh, and then getting it back out. That's where the fees are high. Uh, once you're in there and you're only on the Lightning network, then your fees are low and your speed is high. But yes, uh, making that transaction transition can be expensive. Yeah, so it's almost like... Uh, a deal breaker in a way. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, let's see. Tara is here. Thank you for being here. Scott Lee, I already said. Sawachi, Blessed Tree, and Dave Flowers. Dumb three-year-old Adam Osmosis and Dot Today down 40%. Spread it all out into a bunch of other cool stuff. Sounds good. So, uh, like, uh, I want to thank everyone again for being here. If you've never been in my live stream, check out the description. I've got an overview of what we're going to talk about. I've got some great affiliate links. If you're interested in any of these services or products, um, I invite you to use my link to go check out their site. Uh, doesn't mean you have to buy it, but if you do, I will get credit for it. Helps me out, helps the channel. I always appreciate that. So, I've got a link to 
Coinbase. Uh, there's still uh, a deal on the Ledger Nano X and the Ledger Nano S Plus Orange, uh, and they'll donate to uh, Bitcoin development when you buy those, and then a whole bunch of other uh, affiliate links, and then the news stories that we're going to cover tonight. I've got all those linked there down below, uh, so if you want to read the entire story, uh, you've got uh, access to it uh, by those links down there. So we'll start off with the newly released Satoshi emails that reveal a treasure trove of early Bitcoin lore. Now, I'm kind of a history buff by nature, so this kind of stuff appeals to me. And, you know, it intersects with my other great interest, which is cryptocurrency and self-custody. So um, this is an interesting little story for me. I thought I'd lead with this. Joseph, thank you so much for your uh, donation there. Just emailed you a non-urgent question with reference to Ledger Live. I'll check that out. Definitely. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, as far as, you know, Joseph mentioned, he shot me an email. My email is in the description down below, thecryptodad at gmail.com. Pretty easy. No underscores, no periods. It's just thecryptodad, one word, at gmail.com. So if you have a burning question and I don't get to your question here tonight, um, Please just shoot me an email. Um, I'm not. I won't charge you for an email reply, uh, but try to make it as uh, concise and um, coherent as possible. Don't just shoot me an email that says, "Please help me, sir." <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know what to do with those. Uh, but yeah, just uh, put your. You know, and plus, uh, I mean. Uh, in order for you to properly phrase a question and to, to put it into words helps the catharsis on your end to to, you know, to get the question out. You know, a lot of people, uh, they just want to call, pick up the phone and call somebody. But actually uh, writing it down coherently is a good exercise in patience and uh, will help clarify the question in your mind as well. Uh, there's that uh, alert for Joseph coming in. Tom is here tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Tom. You didn't have to do that. Uh, but I, I do appreciate you, as always. Um, I know the history. Tom and I know the history. So <laughs> it's an inside joke. But yeah, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate that. Uh, Tom and I go way back. We used to uh, do one on one Zoom sessions. And uh, that can be arranged uh, if you need something like that. But uh, shoot me an email first and we'll see. Maybe I can solve your problem without having to, you know, go into a paid session or anything like that. So I'm always open to email questions for anybody here in the live stream or anywhere else on YouTube that just runs across my videos. Uh, my email is uh, available for all. So uh, let's talk about this story a little bit. He he touches first of all what is this what how did this happen right uh so a gentleman named uh marty malmi published 120 pages of email correspondences between the two on github on february 23rd uh my email correspondence with satoshi pretty cool and uh let's check it out let's go over here and i think he probably has a link to the github and there it is. Boom. That's all of it right there. That's a lot, too. Boy, look at that. Ooh, pretty cool stuff. But the uh, overview is here. Uh, the, the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto re remains a point of conjecture throughout the greater cryptocurrency and blockchain community. However, the emails recently published on GitHub were initially introduced as evidence in a London court case brought by the Open Crypto Open Patent Alliance against Craig Wright, who has claimed to be Nakamoto. Now, I like this one right here. This is really cool. This is like a little blurb about the it, Bitcoin's release, right? I uploaded 0 0.3.0 beta to SourceForge and updated the links on Bitcoin.org. I still need to post the announcement message, but here it is, you know, announcing version 0.3 of Bitcoin, the P2P cryptocurrency. 
Bitcoin as a digital currency using cryptography and a distributed network to replace the need for a trusted central server. Boy, that just puts it so well, doesn't it? Escape the arbitrary inflation risk of centrally managed currencies. Bitcoin's total circulation is limited to 21 million coins. The coins are gradually being released to the network nodes based on the CPU power they contribute. You can get a share of them just by installing the software and contributing your idle CPU time. Boy, those are the days, you know. I wish I had done that back in 2008 um, or nine. you know. That would have just been uh, a hobbyist kind of thing, and I probably would have done it had I thought about it or knew about it. I didn't really uh, stumble across Bitcoin until, until several years later. Uh, but then uh, he's got a list of features here. So it's a really cool article. You might want to check it out on your own. Um, talking about the, he gave an estimate of the number of nodes that he thought might need to run. Um, now this, I love this, you know, because we have gone back and forth over this uh, Bitcoin bashing. Uh, goes all the way back to 2018 and 19. See, earlier than that, in 2017, the Bitcoin bashers were all saying stuff like, oh, Bitcoin is worth nothing. It's based on nothing. It's only used by criminals. Those were the main ones. Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and it's only used by criminals, which if you think about it, they contradict each other. So if it has no value, then why the heck are criminals using it, right? So it just doesn't, uh, those two don't seem to jive. But as Bitcoin started to gain traction, they started coming up with new ways to bash Bitcoin. And the big one that emerged in 2018 and 19 was that it uses too much energy. It's not green. And so they go on and on and on about how Bitcoin is wasting energy. And they repeated this lie so often that there are a lot of government agencies that have made regulations based on those lies being true. Um, and so there uh, are regulations that are coming down on Bitcoin miners uh, because they're not green, you know. But l here's an overview of uh, Satoshi's Nakamoto's uh, take on that. Unfortunately, proof of work is the only solution. Proof of work being uh, you're going to need to uh, use processing power uh, to keep the Bitcoin network um, secure. I have found uh, to make P2P eCash work. See, he's, here he's still calling it P2P eCash, right? <laughs> uh, and not cryptocurrency. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, even if I wasn't using it secondarily as a way to allocate the initial distribution of currency, proof of work is fundamental to coordinating the network and preventing double spending. Double spending being the, the, the innovation of Bitcoin. There were uh, attempts at digital currency, decentralized digital currency, but the number one failure of those attempts was double spending, where people would spend some uh, of the currency and then right away try to spend it again. Um, and so Bitcoin solved that issue uh, through proof of work. So if it did grow to consume significant energy, I think it would still be less wasteful than the labor and resource intensive conventional banking activity it would replace. The cost would be an order of magnitude less than the billions in banking fees that pay for all those brick and mortar buildings, skyscrapers and junk mail credit card offers. Right. So you want to talk about not being green, the legacy financial system. And he sort of put it very succinctly right here. Um, I just don't understand how people can bash Bitcoin for not being green and not see the elephant in the room, which is how wasteful uh, banks are uh, moving cash around with trucks and uh, brick and mortar buildings that need power and junk mail and all of this stuff and skyscrapers. <laughs> I just I, I thought that was really prescient of him to bring this topic up early on. Right. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, the interesting thing about uh, the word cryptocurrency, apparently <clears throat> Satoshi didn't come up with this. Uh, he, uh, he mentioned that he saw someone else using it. Uh, someone came up with the word cryptocurrency. Maybe it's a word we should use when describing Bitcoin. Do you like it? <laughs> so pretty cool. Anyway, uh, I don't want to go uh, for the whole uh, uh, session just on this story, but I think it's a really cool and interesting story. Um, I will also point out, uh, based on Cointelegraph's curs cursory examination of the emails, there are no smoking guns or telltale revelations that would immediately shine a light on Satoshi's true identity, right? So uh, if that's what you're after, it didn't really come up in this. Um, and then on that same note, uh, there uh, still is a trial going on with Craig Wright, who claims to be Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and I, I linked that down below because um, I just thought it was related to this story. I didn't actually read the entire article here, uh, but there is a trial going on. Um, if you've ever encountered a Craig Wright de devotee, um, they are almost cultish in their belief that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and they also claim that Bitcoin Cash is the true Bitcoin or uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision is the true Bitcoin. All three of what we call Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV uh, share a common blockchain history up to a point. And then it was in 2017 that Bitcoin Cash forked off onto uh, its own fork. Um, and then uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision uh, forked off of Bitcoin Cash. But I mean, uh, who's to say what the real Bitcoin is? But uh, what we call Bitcoin uh, is 51,606 per coin in US dollars, the market value, whereas Bitcoin Cash is a lot less. So kind of the proof is in the pudding. Uh, but there are a lot of devotees that will still Venom, venom, venomously claim that Bitcoin Cash is the true Bitcoin, and we're all just pretenders. <laughs> Interesting article. You might want to check it out. Uh, I didn't want to uh, pass up a chance to talk a little bit about AI in relation to NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA, if you've been hearing about NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA is a, a company that makes graphical uh, process, graphic processing units. Um, I've been using uh, GeForce uh, graphic cards in my rig for years now, uh, but they make more than just GPUs. Uh, they make really high-end type stuff that can be used for uh, AI, and they are the premier hardware uh, that most AI runs on. So they released earnings after the bell this week, and it was just like uh, way above expectations. Their price shot up. Uh, they gained billions in market share within 24 hours. Just a crazy story about NVIDIA. And it does sort of relate to cryptocurrency in a way because there are some AI-based cryptocurrencies that uh, have been on the rise over the last month or so. Um, and so I thought I would just post this article that we could talk about it a little bit. Uh, so you can see that there are, I don't usually recommend coins or anything, but I did want to point out that there is a, an AI sector of cryptocurrency that you may not be aware of. And I thought I would uh, pin this article down there so that you could check them out if you were interested. Uh, RNDR, uh, Tau, FET, AKT, uh, AGIX, Ocean, and Korgagi. Um, have all been up quite a bit, all right? So these are the AI-related tokens. All right, I want to spend a whole lot, and then uh, I can't not talk about Reddit. Um, Rapids, thanks for that subscription. Uh, Reddit is going public, and there's a lot of stories uh, about Reddit, but uh, what I find interesting is that they are um, a soon-to-be public company that 
possesses Bitcoin and Ethereum in their company treasury, which uh, is interesting. We'll see more and more of this going forward. Um, that's a big deal. That's adoption. Uh, that's good for adoption, right? The Social News Network also revealed it has been experimenting with Ether and Matic as a form of payment for the sale of virtual goods. So they might incorporate uh, cryptocurrency payments into their platform. Now, Musk has been talking about this with X for quite a while, but I haven't seen it. Um, maybe it's in there and I just don't know about it. But uh, he talked about accepting Dogecoin uh, for payments within Twitter or X, as it's called now. And so um, Reddit is also talking about that. Uh, but they do use some of their cash to purchase cryptocurrency. Basically, they say that it's more it's not really so much as an investment as it is a way for them to experiment with um, using the cryptocurrency on their platform for payments. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Um, uh, I use Reddit quite often. Um, I use it um, to discuss or look at discussions or, uh, you know, find out what people are talking about with uh, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency and Monero. And then uh, I use it uh, for the games that I like to play. There's there's a forum for just about any subject that you might if, if you've never used Reddit before, uh, I may be preaching to the choir. Uh, but uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on now in relation to uh, new technology and uh, integrating in with cryptocurrencies. Um, and then uh, I believe I also linked this story down below, uh, the uh, IPO filing, uh, which is a little more in depth. It's an opinion piece about the uh, Reddit IPO. There's one thing that I forgot to mention in the first story that we were talking about where uh, Satoshi talked about anonymity. Uh, a lot of people ask about anonymity. Uh, Taking Care of Business had some anonymity questions early before the stream, which I'm going to address. But I did want to uh, talk about uh, Satoshi's take on that. Uh, Bitcoin is not an anonymous cryptocurrency. The blockchain is transparent. Um, now, an end user might figure a way to use Bitcoin anonymously, but by design, Bitcoin is not anonymous. It is pseudonymous, which means that it can be used. Uh, you can send and receive uh, value without having to attach your name to it. And that that's a big plus. I mean, that's that's kind of a, a giant thing, really, because usually when you if you want to buy something without you know, having to give out your all of your personal information, you use cash. So but that's an in-person form of anonymous payment or pseudonymous, right? Because people can see you, right? Uh, but Bitcoin is a digital way to send value across the Internet without having to reveal all of your personal details. Just think about it. Anything that you buy on the Internet, um, any subscription service or Amazon purchase or any kind of thing that you if from any retailer that you buy online, if you want to interact with them and send and make a purchase, you have to give them your name, your address, uh, your credit card number, you know, all this stuff that uh, reveals a lot about you to them in order to make a purchase. With Bitcoin, uh, if they accept Bitcoin, you can send them the Bitcoin and receive the product. Now, it depends. I mean, if you're if it's being shipped to your house, then, of course, you'll need to give them personal information. But you might be purchasing a VPN or uh, something of that nature where really uh, if you the, the right OPSEC is done, then it's pretty much anonymous, um, uh, but not really anonymous. But you don't they don't know who you are or, or need to know. Right. Um, so but Bitcoin is not totally anonymous. And, and Satoshi talked about this. Um, he says, I think we should de-emphasize the anonymous angle. With the popularity of Bitcoin addresses, instead of sending by IP, we can't give the impression it's automatically anonymous. It's possible to be pseudonymous, but you have to be careful, 
right? Just as I was mentioning, you have to have good OPSEC for that. If someone digs through the transaction history and starts exposing information people thought was anonymous, the backlash will be much worse if we haven't prepared expectations by warning in advance that you have to take precautions. So basically what he's saying here is that in order to be pseudonymous or possibly an anonymous, you really have to, to take a lot of precautions and have good OPSEC. You can't just tell everyone, hey, we've got this anonymous way of making payments because they'll get discovered and then it'll hurt their repu the Bitcoin's reputation once people find out. So basically, he wanted to put it up out front, you know, get ahead of it. Hey, it's not totally anonymous. Um, it can be pseudonymous if you uh, are careful, right? So that's, you know, Satoshi's take on this whole issue of anonymity. Um, and so I'd like to go back here. Um, I see that uh, taking care of business is putting in uh, some more down here, but I'm scrolling back up to the very top uh, before the live stream. And I wanted to read out uh, taking care of businesses questions here so we can discuss a little bit on this. And I have one more story that I'm going to show you. <laughs> If you were trying to be anonymous but had to test your new crypto network with the first transaction, how would you do it? Probably send it to yourself, right? Um, it, it's hard to know um, if, uh, I mean, if you're just trying to test to see if it's going to work, then sending a transaction to yourself works just fine, although it's a little bit confusing because it, it occurs in the same wallet. And so there's a little bit of room for doubt as to, well, did it really go go anywhere or did it just come back into my own wallet? But yeah, you can see transactions going in and out of wallets and, and maybe that might be a good way to test. It depends on what your ultimate aim is. If you're trying to make a purchase of something, without being detected, it's really difficult to know whether you've been detected or not. Um, and so uh, the test would be a little difficult, right? Um, you might need someone somewhere on the other end that w could get the cryptocurrency and then attest to the fact that uh, they didn't see any of they couldn't tell where it came from, that sort of thing. I don't know. Um, it, it, testing it on yourself might satisfy you that the wallet works, but it would be hard to know if you really did it anonymously or not. Uh, but I did want to bring up this story now. Don't, don't go crazy, people. Uh, don't start uh, um, getting into this left, right, blue, red paradigm. I'm bringing up a story that involves Trump, so don't be mad. <laughs> But uh, the uh, the currently the prosecutor in the Georgia case um, has uh, went to court or a, a deposition uh, concerning a relationship with someone else that's working on the case. Now, that's there's nothing illegal about that, but uh, it does uh, have um, there there is a. Um, whether there is uh, a conflict of interest in this case. Um, and it could disqualify her. It's a possibility uh, from being on the case. So this is important. This is a national, there's a national spotlight on this trial right now. And of course, you know, both sides go, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what she's doing with her, you know, with her relationships or anything. And it really it doesn't. But what I the reason I wanted to bring up this story is because both of them testified recently that they uh, they're in a relationship, but that it didn't start until a certain time, uh, which was uh, 2022. Well, um, they found uh, the, the Trump lawyer subpoenaed AT&T for Wade's cell phone records. All right. Uh, between uh, January and uh, November of 2021, which was the time frame where they said they were not in a relationship. Um, and then they uh, they hired an investigator to analyze that data. Uh, with an analytical tool which generated geolocation data. All right. And so uh, 
Wade and Willis exchanged over 2,000 voice calls and just under 12,000 text messages from January 1st to, to January 21 through November 30th of 21. So just the sheer volume of their correspondence um, can reveal something w about what was going on. Now that you could say, oh, this was work related, possibly. Uh, geolocation data indicates Wade was at D.A. Willis's condo at least 35 occasions. The data revealed he was stationary at the condo and not in transit. Uh, Wade's visits to D.A. Willis's condo were corroborated by texts and phone calls. According to the report, on November 29, 21, following a call from Ms. Willis at 1130 p.m., while the call continued, Wade's phone left the East Cobb area just after midnight and arrived at the geofence location of the Dogwood address, the condo, at 1243 a.m. on November 30th, 2021. The phone remained there until 4.55 a.m. Um, on September 11th, Wade, uh, 2021, Wade arrived at the condo. Uh, at 10.45 p.m., he left the address at 3.28 a.m. and arrived at his Marietta residence at 4.05 a.m. and then texted D.A. Willis at 4.20 a.m. Uh, now, whatever they want to make of this, that's not really what we're here to discuss. I wanted to point this out as to the amount, if you think that you are anonymous uh, on the phone, you are wrong. Uh, this data was collected by the phone carrier. This is all AT&T's data. And it was quite easy for Trump's lawyers to subpoena this data. Um, so AT&T has access to this. Uh, you can bet your sweet bippy that the government would have access to any of this data should they ask for it uh, for on any number of reasons why they might want to request this data. And a lot of times their request would be, you know, secure uh, national security. So um, even AT&T wouldn't even be able to uh, there'd be like a gag order. The, the government requested this data uh, and what this reveals about where we go and what we do. We're talking about being anonymous here. So if you're at home and you have your phone with you, and you're trying to send cryptocurrency uh, anonymously on the Internet, um, they can tie the, your location uh, to the, the IP address that the transaction is coming from. And even if you are in uh, a coffee shop, if you've got your go-to phone with you, then you, geolocation data will can tie you to that transaction. Um, and th th this story reveals a just a huge amount of data about where he was wh and when and what he was doing, texting and calling. Uh, and this is just the AT&T data. Can you imagine if we had access to the Google data and the Apple data? Um, we would know like his heart rate. I mean, I mean, this stuff, if you're trying just the idea of trying to remain anonymous in today's society um, and the and the links that you have to go to, um, I mean, you would have to be somewhere where your phone wasn't. Uh, and that's very inconvenient. I don't like to go anywhere without my phone. Um, so I just thought that I would bring up this story in our little discussion of anonymity. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go down here. There's a lot of uh, people asking questions. I'm going to, uh, I think they say that 5% of the world's energy goes to Bitcoin BTC. If that's correct, it's a lot. I don't know uh, if that's um, accurate or not. I haven't seen that particular figure. Um, you'll... But it should also be, if if that is true, and I don't know that it's true, uh, it should be tempered with that Bitcoin mining is not fully powered by uh, coal-based energy. 
Uh, a lot of Bitcoin mining is powered by geothermal energy, solar energy. Um, I guess, I don't know if dams, if that's geothermal or not. What is that? No. A dam is like water power or whatever. I don't know what the proper term for it is. But there were a lot of Bitcoin miners that were um, st that set up shop in China near dams um, to get that cheap energy. Um, although Bitcoin mining, I believe, has been outlawed in China, sort of, I guess. Uh, didn't we say the value of BTC was around 31K now? Cost of mining one BTC, I believe. I don't know how to quantify that to gold ounces, but could be less, actually. Um, right now, we're looking at 51,000, I believe, tonight, at least. 51,614. Uh, lightning withdrawals out of Kraken are zero fee. I didn't realize some charge for it. Interesting. I didn't know you could do that. So that's not a bad way to fund your lightning wallet. If you, you set up a lightning node and then you fund it from Kraken for free, that's not a bad way to get going, right? Thank you for pointing that out, Kelly P. Uh, let's see, can only use Matic for payments. ETH will charge you 50 times the price. The hide and buy. Yes, Ethereum fees are very high. I agree. Uh, let's see, JDO's in the house. Good to have you. I don't think it was too many other wallets at the time. I think he would create two wallets. I watched Fanny live and she did herself no favor saying <laughs> JDO. Yeah, I kind of watched a little bit about that. <laughs> Fanny, just a movie. Uh, used only cash to pay for all the trips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> witch hunt camp. Yeah. Well, uh, we can uh, we can use that term on both ends, right? Um, who, who's the witch hunter? <laughs> Interesting stuff. But I wanted to focus more on the the phone data, uh, what the phone data revealed, and how. Um, a pervasent that is um, as far as our personal anonymity goes. Uh, let's see. AT&T goes to your band, so yes, they can, yeah. Also, if you use VPN, they can track that too. Yeah, um, so uh, thank you, Christine. Yeah, if you've got a VPN that's based in the U.S., they are... Um, uh, subject to U.S. law and can be subpoenaed for their uh, logs. And if you're paying with a credit card for your VPN, uh, then it's kind of uh, uh, trivial to um, find whatever you've been doing protected by your VPN. Uh, now, uh, there are VPNs that you can uh, buy uh, and sign up for. Um, and Mulvad, is, I, don't, I think I, I didn't spell it right. Mulvad is uh, a VPN that you can uh, pay, pay with crypto. Uh, so, yeah, if you pay with Bitcoin, then uh, you don't need to give them your personal information. Really, um, it would be much harder to track you down. Uh, but Mulvad is uh, foreign based. I believe they're uh, headquartered in Sweden, which has very... Uh, tough privacy laws, very difficult for law enforcement to subpoena their logs, right? But not impossible, right? So it makes it more difficult. So um, you have to think about this kind of stuff. A lot of people, they'll just sign up for a VPN and think they're safe. They don't realize that VPNs can be subpoenaed and that all of the personal information for their payment method is available um, to whoever subpoenas them. Right. So if you want to do anonymous, then a VPN is a good start, but you have to use the right VPN and you have to use the right payment method. Right. You have to be very careful when you set these things up. Um, let's see here. Off topic PayPal or Venmo for my Celsius account. Don't have experience with either. Um, I have never used crypto in Venmo. But uh, I have used it in um, PayPal, not a lot. Um, I know both of those services, uh, it's rather expensive to use cryptocurrency. Um, the fees are pretty high for withdrawal and or selling your crypto. Um, but the reason that um, 
Celsius uses them is because um, and they can verify the owner um, legally. Uh, if I just say, hey, can you send that Bitcoin back to my Bitcoin wallet? You know, they could send it to my Bitcoin wallet and then I could claim it. I never got it and that kind of stuff. So that's why they want you to use um PayPal and Venmo because you have to provide identifying information, right? There, there's, uh, you can't deny that you received it with those services, right? There's, there's a record that's tied to your identity. Um, so I use PayPal. I don't know which one has cheaper fees, um, but as far as being safe and secure, uh, they're probably about the same. It's not self custody. That is uh, custodial. It's just like. Um, a cryptocurrency exchange. So if I were to receive a large amount of Bitcoin from Celsius into my PayPal account, crypto, I would immediately withdraw it to my own wallet. Asil, thank you for that. I appreciate that. You're the best. Thank you for being here every week. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I hope that answered your question, Mike uh, 68, Crypto Mike 68. Uh, Think Blue. Hey, everyone. Question. Can I use coin control in Trezor Suite to consolidate the UTXOs? Maybe an idea for a vid is an updated Trezor Suite tutorial. Thank you. I don't know. I never used coin control personally. Um, most of my um, transactions were fairly large and although I do have one um, wallet that I do get a lot of uh, affiliate payments in I've used it for years but uh, I didn't notice that the fees were horrible but a lot of people that have been you know putting micro payments in a particular wallet over years uh, have noticed very high fees and have tried to use coin control to somehow consolidate all of those transactions uh, in order to save fees. Uh, like I said, I've never actually done it, and I don't know if you have that capability within Trezor Suite. Um, that would be a good thing for me to research and maybe do a video on. Um, I would think it would be in, uh, well, let's see if I can... Let's see if I can. I don't I don't think I'm. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's see here. I see export. I'm not sure if they have it, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I don't see coin control. Uh, but I, I I'd probably I'd have to look a little more into that. I did want to show you guys with Trezor Suite. A lot of people have been asking me, can you manage more than one device in Trezor Suite? And yes, you can. It's pretty straightforward. Notice here up in the left corner that I've got two devices that I'm managing in this Trezor Suite, and neither of them is connected at the moment. So uh, it's pretty. Uh, it, it's a pretty good way of managing multiple devices in one piece of software. Ledger Live is not quite as straightforward. Uh, you can use multiple devices in Ledger Live, but they don't force you to uh, sort of sandbox them, right? Keep them separate. You have, you're responsible for naming them accordingly so that you can keep them straight. Whereas Trezor Suite has like this whole, you flip between the devices to see your balances. Um, I did, I brought this up on Wednesday, but the latest version of Ledger Live now filters spam NFTs. I think that's pretty cool. A lot of people uh, been, had a lot of anxiety about spam NFTs, even though they are basically harmless. If you don't interact with them, people are, you know, uh, paranoid and superstitious with their crypto. And when they see a bunch of spam NFTs, they get worried. And so Ledger. Uh, in this new release has figured out a way to uh, filter out the spam NFTs. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, how can we trust your figures now taking care of business? <laughs> uh, OK, any idea when Ledger Stacks is going to be delivered? No, I really don't. I wish I did. Um, it was my there was a rumor that they were shooting for quarter Q1. Um, I'm not sure when Q1 ends, but uh, it's still February. So if it comes out in Q1, it shouldn't be long. But that's just a rumor. 
Um, I, as far as I know, they, they're having a trouble uh, implementing that e-ink screen technology to scale. In other words, um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, uh, it was kind of, I, w I don't want to say pipe dream, but it was kind of a, uh, a, a jump to think that they can implement an e-ink screen of that size. Um, I have a, um, the Secure X card has an e-ink screen here just up that little rectangle there. It's a really cool little device. The, the screen works really well, but this is a very tiny little screen. Um, it's a beautiful little screen, uh, so clear and easy to read. But to take uh, something that small and implement it in a much larger device um, had never been tried or done before and still really hasn't. Uh, apparently, I mean, they've got some uh, Ledger Stacks demos there at Ledger that they've been testing and playing around with and, you know, improving on and all kinds of stuff. They just can't mass produce these things. That's the issue. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know when they're going to get it up. Uh, let's see. All caps. Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> Valuable VPN information. Uh, you're welcome, Asil. Uh, let's see. Diesel Kane, you want me? <laughs> Uh, Gladiator just joined. Thank you. It's good to have you. I appreciate it. Uh, Rex, can I transfer ADA to a Trezor wallet? Uh, yeah, uh, Trezor supports um, Cardano natively. So, uh, yeah, if you want to buy a Trezor, uh, you can store your uh, ADA on there. Um, I don't, I th yeah, they support tokens too, so you'll be able to see your ADA tokens. Uh, it's about the same. Well, I think Ledger Live will. Oh, and they, they support ADA staking. Oh, oh no, they don't. <laughs> it's not active. Okay. Uh, but Ledger Live does so far. So um, if you're looking to stake ADA or Cardano, um, you can do it in Ledger Live. All right. Uh, but you can store. And you can store ADA and uh, manage your tokens on a Trezor device in Trezor Suite. Uh, let's see. I did switch to Trezor. Hope it's more safe. LOL. Yeah. Um, oh, the discussion tonight. I kind of wanted to talk about that. Um, I know there's the, and, and feel free to shoot out questions if I'm getting too far off topic, but I wanted to discuss updates and everyone that uh, is a regular in my live stream knows how I feel about updates. They should be done uh, always when they're available. You should run your updates on your firmware and on your software and even your apps require updates occasionally, too. So uh, for a ledger device, you've got three things. You've got the ledger live software and then, uh, you know, look at we're just talking about the latest version of ledger live supports a really good, valuable feature that you wouldn't have if you're just cowering under your desk thinking that if I update Ledger Live, I'm going to lose my crypto. Um, I am not exaggerating. There are people that are just terrified that if they update their Ledger Live, they're going to lose their crypto. Um, and there's really, you should not be feeling like that. Um, I was talking about Reddit earlier, and like I said, I use it all the time. I love it. I think it's a great tool. But there is a rumor mill um, uh, and there is a group think uh, that can uh, happen on Reddit uh, or anywhere, really. It happens on YouTube a lot, too. There's just people come out with a narrative with basically no proof, and then they run with it, and then everyone that hears about it that's new just accepts it as the, as the truth. And one of those is that Ledger built a backdoor into their firmware. That is that is not true. There is no proof of that. Um, and then their proof is, well, you can't prove it's not. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that I can't prove it's not. But just saying that I can't prove it's not is not giving me proof that it is, right? So you're claiming that uh, there's a firmware update there's a firmware backdoor built into the update. And the only reason you can claim that is because their software is not open source, and so we have no way of knowing. So 
there is, right? That that is totally uh, illogical, right? Um, because we because their software is not open source, we have no way of knowing, so we must assume it. It is. Um, I could give you the same argument for why it's not, right? Because we don't know what the code is doing. Anyway, uh, we have the performance of the item. Uh, I've had my ledger for years, and my crypto has never mysteriously disappeared. There is not one case of a ledger wallet being emptied remotely uh, because ledger has the private key or some other thing. Most crypto wallets um, lose people lose crypto uh, using hardware wallets by revealing their seed phrase so but i wanted to bring up a story and i don't really i, I mean uh, the the uh the gentleman um let me see if i can find his post here real quick it is public i mean when you post on a youtube channel um it's public uh let me i'm just gonna without revealing too much personal information if i can't I, I think it was in this video just give me a second here back door built in whoops um okay here it is now i don't want to call this guy out or anything um but you know he posted this publicly and uh in this live stream from Wednesday, I reiterated my stance that you should always keep your device up to date. And so uh, he called me out. He's like, hold on. Telling people to update and not worry about things is ridiculous. So I'm wrong, right, for telling people to keep their device up to date. First off, 2017, I bought a bunch of Bitcoin, ordered the Nano X, uh, and put the Bitcoin on my ledger. I did not update it for three years because there was no reason to view the balances. Uh, come 2020, I loaded up the ledger and it told me I would have to update the firmware before it would let me into the device. Well, guess what? After I updated it, I lost all my friggin' crypto and I could not find my 24 word seed phrase. The paper I had written on was somewhere. Uh, to this day, I have no idea where in my room that page could be, and it's worth 51K. Poof, gone. It's Ledger's fault. I can only blame them. Uh, so, um, I hate to say this, but he just gave the case for why you should keep your device up to date. Um, I replied to him and let him know that I've been using, a, I have a Ledger Nano S that I've had since 2017, and it works just fine. Uh, because I've kept it up to date with firmware updates. If you throw it in a drawer for three years and uh, don't run firmware updates, then it will not uh, be capable of updating to the latest firmware. A lot of people discovered this. That is a known issue. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit inconvenient. But the kicker is, is that had he had a seed phrase, he would have been able to restore on a new device. But he lost his seed phrase. So uh, self-custody is about self-responsibility, um, and uh, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. We live in a society where uh, you know anything that goes wrong, we want to blame somebody. We want to blame the company um, when you know the phone. You know, I drop my phone. <laughs> in the water, I want to call the phone company and, and tell them they sold me a, a, a faulty phone. Um, uh, we're always looking to blame someone besides ourselves, you know, and crypto is the antithesis of that attitude. Crypto is a buyer beware, a user beware. Um, you are fully responsible for everything. So write down your seed phrase, save it in a safe place, keep your device up to date. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, updates give you uh, the latest features that we talked about with Ledger Live, right? Uh, they give us the latest security fixes. They give us uh, the latest bug fixes. They give us the latest feature updates. Cryptocurrency is not static. 
cryptocurrency changes. So you need a device that can adapt to those changes, right? The apps need to change when the, the, the blockchain developers for whatever crypto add new features, they need to update their app. And so the device itself needs to be updatable. If we had static hardware devices that had no updates possible, then you'd need a new one like every six months to a year. And that's not very practical, right? So our devices are updatable by design and they should stay up to date uh, if you want the best performance, the best security, um, you know, the, the, the most reliable use and everything else. Um, please don't fall into that trap of thinking that somehow you're putting your crypto at risk by running an update. I don't know how that became, uh, you know, the, the current narrative, but it has. Ever since the Ledger Recover feature came out and this whole controversy erupted, um, all of the so-called experts saying that Ledger had just built a backdoor and that we shouldn't trust Ledger anymore has made all the cryptocurrency hardware wallet and software wallet users out there terrified to run updates on their devices and their their software. It's ludicrous. Uh, you should always run updates. Uh, MT loves the show. Thank you. Uh, let's see. None to blame but himself. Yeah, I mean, I felt bad for the guy. Um, I understood completely. I didn't I didn't want to bag on him. But, you know, I, I took issue at him telling me that I was being ridiculous for advocating updating you know that that kind of stuck in my craw a little bit but um you know i've learned to develop thick skin over the years i've been called idiot and a lot worse in my youtube comments uh stupid is as stupid does thank you scott mt thanks again for that donation uh yeah you can buy silver it doesn't need firmware updates neither does gold uh, we'll write down three tenths number and even remember it by here, but a five figure wallet and nah, leave it. Um, yeah. And we had also talked a little bit about, you know, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but in managing your seed phrase, don't do anything fancy. Uh, write it down um, on one piece of paper and store it in a safe place. Don't split it up. Don't write it in code. Don't write half of it and memorize the rest you know, five years later and you come back to it and you forget. Um, I've had some people give me those stories. I had one guy telling me that, you know, he had his seed phrases hidden in different safes in different countries and he was going to leave them to his kids. But it wasn't the seed phrase that he had in the safe deposit box. It was codes that were based on a constellation that were just a bunch of numbers and that, you know, they from those codes, they could recreate the seed phrase. That's uh, just a recipe for disaster. So just keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> write it down or mark it on a piece of metal or whatever you want to do um, and store it safely, um, just like you would, uh, you know, of anything of value, a, a fine painting, fine bottle of wine, some gold coins, uh, your engagement ring, your wedding band, whatever. You know, we all have things that, you know, we uh, need to keep safe and secure. That's all. That's physical security, right? That's I mean, we should all know about that. So write down your seed phrase and then use what you know about physical security to keep it in a safe place where no one will find it or steal it. Uh huh. Uh, Dan, Dan here. Dan is here. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I don't think I had said hello to you tonight. I'm glad to have you using your uh, Dan Westro handle, I see. <laughs> uh, so if you don't update it for so long and plug it in, you can't just see your crypto. It's not up to date. Uh, not always. Um, there was, uh, with the uh, Ledger Nano S, the, the original one, there was an issue with the way the firmware updates work, that if you waited too long, the device became unusable. Uh, but that, that's not, a, that's not a, a 100 percent on every hardware wallet, right? There might be like your Ledger Nano X, you might be able to go for a year or two or three or four, who knows, uh, but don't risk it, right? 
um, or a ledger or, or a Trezor or any other one of these hardware wallets that I've done videos on, um, it, it it is possible to limp along without doing your updates and still have access to your crypto. I'm just saying there were some particular incidents involving the Legend NOS where it was in fact unusable because he had skipped too many updates, right? Um, but that's not 100% with every device out there. Uh, let's see, James E. Uh, Dan recently updated a ledger that was not used for two years and it took an hour to install all the past updates. Okay, so it, it, it was a little bit inconvenient for Dan, but he was able to get his device functional again, which is so th that's that's an example of it not being unusable, just a little bit inconvenient. James E. People need to remember Ledger, a French company, and they have a quirky stance on things. Remember the very first Nano S hardware wallet? It came with a necklace strap. Carry the wallet on the go. Yeah, they did. They were a little quirky. I must say that I went to New York for a Ledger conference thing. I forget what they called it. And the CEO of Ledger was there, and he was a pretty flamboyant guy. He had a ring on every finger. And I mean, he's French, I guess. I mean, if that, I, I don't think all the French people are like that, but I was a little taken aback by that. I was like, you have a ring on every finger? I mean, that's a little over the top, if you ask me. But hey, um, I'm just a American dude, right? Uh, if you put a wallet into a security deposit box and took it out after 10 years, you could not get your crypto. No, that, that, that it's possible that the device won't work, uh, but it's not a given, right? You might still be able to update the device and use it. It's much more, uh, but it, it's much, if you're going to put something away for 10 years, a seed phrase is ideal for that. But a hardware device um, for 10 years is probably not the best way to store crypto uh, because a hardware device has to have firmware updates. It might not work. Now, there are certain uh, hardware wallets that might be more static that might, if you're going to put it away for 10 years, might make more sense than a ledger. Um, but a ledger is a very versatile and flexible device, and it does need to have periodic updates. So if you want to put something away for 10 years, it would make more sense to, to put the seed phrase there so that after 10 years, you could import the seed phrase into whatever the current you know, go-to device is. Uh, the, the seed phrase is much more um, has much more longevity than the hardware device itself. Uh, everything in the world is always updating. This includes your wallet. Thank you, Diesel. Yeah, that's a good uh, observation there. Is it possible that Satoshi pretended he was not the inventor? He was playing dumb? Could be. Yeah. Uh, which cryptos are you going to plan to buy on Thanksgiving? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they have any turkey uh, crypto. Uh, Turkey coin? <laughs> That'd be interesting. I pretty much, you know, I, I tend to be pretty conservative in my uh, crypto purchases. I stick with the top 10 or 20, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, Avalanche, and uh, Solana are on my radar. Um, but, you know, uh, I can't really give you advice as to which coins to buy, you know. Uh, and I can't, I, I went over some of the crypto that I had in, uh, that I had bought back in 2021, uh, where I threw in a thousand dollars and now it's like less than 10, uh, the holdings that I had. So I'm really not the person to go to, uh, for investment advice. I can teach you how to keep your crypto safe and secure. Uh, do you have an exit strategy for your crypto? Talk to Dan. Dan is pretty good with developing a, uh, you, you know, Dan's thing. Dan, our moderator, uh, says that the, the best thing to do is to have a uh, plan and that uh, you should stick to it. You, you know, set yourself a price and say, OK, if it hits this price, I'm selling 50 percent. Come hell or high water. Don't wait until it hits that price and then get wishy-washy about it, right? You'll, you'll kick yourself. So, 
My real name is Clark Kent. <laughs> Crypto coin guy can see XLM going that high if the assets get placed on Stellar blockchain, but the XRP is the new SWIFT and may be purchased by the establishment if we all keep holding XRP. Oh, well said about updates besides a platform that sent no updates would be a red flag. True. Dress and deportment. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Good evening, all. Does Ledger announce their updates? Do they send out emails? Uh, Ledger, no. Uh, they don't send out emails when there's updates. You have to launch Ledger Live on a regular basis for the updates. Uh, the same with um, Trezor Suite. So um, it would behoove you to launch your Trezor Suite Trezor suite or your uh, ledger live on a fairly regular basis even if you're just like holding and not doing anything probably once or twice a year uh, maybe a uh, three or four times a year like maybe uh, set a little um, you know once a month or whatever to just launch the software and check for any updates because the the updates come uh, pretty regularly so I wouldn't uh, um, I mean, you could wait a year, I guess, if you wanted to, but it's probably better to, um, you know, at a bare minimum once a year, or maybe I would say the bare minimum would be twice a year, right? Every six months at least. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it only takes a couple of minutes. Um, and the, if, you know, Dan mentioned that when he, uh, got his old device out. It took him like an hour to get it up to updated because of all he had to go through all the previous updates. If you just kind of you, you save yourself that that headache by just doing the updates as they come along and it'll be so much easier uh, than waiting for and letting the, all the updates stack up and then having, you know, to go through several updates in one session. Right. So um, I'd say once a month is a pretty decent plan. Um, I mean, we're, if if you're uh, cust if you're custodying, say, five thousand dollars worth of crypto at a minimum or, you know, or even let's say it's fifty thousand. If it's fifty thousand dollars worth of cryptocurrency, don't you owe it to yourself? to uh, check in on it once a month at least to make sure that everything is, you know, where it needs to be uh, with your your wallet and all that stuff, you know? I mean, that's a lot of money to just, like, sit out or, you know, forget about it, right? What's that thing about, uh, you know, put your money to work for you? Well, you know, sometimes you have to work for your money, um, you know, we do it every day when we go to our jobs. But if you've got an, an investment like uh, cryptocurrency, you should check in on it uh, and make sure, you know, uh, everything is updated on a fairly regular basis. Right. It's just common sense. Does anyone have the stacks? What's the deal with the wraparound screen? Interesting design. No, nobody has it. Um, I talked to Ian at Ledger, and apparently uh, he, that, like I said, they have them there at Ledger. They may have slipped some out to their friends, um, but nobody has received this item. Um, it does look pretty cool, and I was really stoked about it when they first came out. I ordered two um, pre-ordered two and then after a year I was I got a refund on one um, I thought it was I mean back in those days I was like I didn't care about two hundred and seventy nine dollars you know I was throwing thousands of dollars around for crypto that I never heard about so that stacks was like ooh, I'm buying that but yeah still not Still not available. You can't even pre-order it anymore. You used to be able to pre-order it. Now you can't. Uh, my take on the avalanche outage. I was a little... Um, I, when I saw the story about the avalanche... Uh, let, me, let me see if I can find it here. Oh. If I can spell. 
so uh, yeah, a few days back, uh, Avalanche uh, kind of the blockchain sort of shut down. Um, I don't think it was for very long, uh, just a few hours. Uh, I think the story was they, they had block production issues um, and they hadn't produced a block in over an hour or two or something like that. Um, I believe that they straightened it out, uh, but I was pretty upset when I saw it. I was like, oh man, that's all we need. Uh, it's stories like this that cause panic and, you know, uh, in fragile times, a story like this could bring down the entire crypto market. Um, but when I saw the story, uh, the little summary said that Avalanche was only down by like one and a half percent on the news. So it wasn't a deal breaker for Avalanche holders. And Solana has had its own problems um, with outages. Um, so it's not... Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a problem, um, but it does sort of bring home that, you know, uh, these are not mathematically perfect models. I mean, the math is works great. Right. But these are software projects. They're, you know, maintained by developers. I used to work as a developer back in the 2000s. It seems like a lifetime ago. But a lot of work goes into coding and maintaining a project, especially when you have multiple people. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, plates in the air, however you want to think about it. Um, so it's not uh, uncommon for things like this to happen. When it involves crypto and money, people are a little weirder about it. But um, I'm glad that it, it got itself resolved. Um, I don't think it is a, a major issue. I guess I'll put it that way. Because it is a software project, it is, the glitches are always possible, right? Uh, we're not looking too bad market-wise right now. Uh, Bitcoin, there, there was a, I remember, I think last week we were, t there were some stories about Bitcoin stalling at 52, and then it just, it broke out past 52, and then stalled at 53,000. So I saw a bunch of stories about, oh, Bitcoin stalled at 53, and I was like, hey, what about 52? I thought that was the deal breaker when it, when it stalled at 52. But then it came back down, and so we're under 52 still today, right now, uh, but if Ethereum is still flirting with 3,000. So overall, uh, things are not bad. Um, I'm not sure what Avalanche is doing right now. Let's see if they've got it in here. The ticker. No, I don't see it. Uh, we can check real quick. Thank you for that subscription. Oh, and Jen Crypto, thank you uh, for that donation. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of talking tonight. I didn't really uh, prepare a bunch of stuff to do tonight, but uh, for step by step, please check my channel. Um, I've got a video on just about any hardware wallet that you might be interested in uh, on setups and restores. Um, I uh, talked to a company. Uh, let me see if I can find this real quick here. Uh, oh, okay. There's the email. I see. Um, okay. Kuvex. So I'm talking with a company that they make a product called Kuvex. And I think it's pretty interesting. And basically what this device does is there's, there's a card and it uses NFC. And I have, they're going to send me a demo of it. But as near as I can tell, you take uh, a, the card and you put it in the device and then somehow you're able to offline uh, enter your seed phrase. And then the seed phrase is imprinted on the card uh, using NFC technology. And so um, the assumption is, is that at any point you could use the card to retrieve the 
seed phrase as well. And so uh, you can imprint this on multiple cards and hide them in different places. And um, it's an interesting concept for managing the seed phrase. Um, I would say that the first objection most people might have is, what if I lose the device and then the cards become useless? Because now I can't access it. But I would assume that you could buy another device and use it to recover something you may have stored on the card. I don't know how secure the card is as far as if someone were to find it, could they connect it to their device? But probably not because the Tangem has that same uh, security issue. And so there's a passcode that you imprint. So I haven't used it yet, but I think it looks very interesting. Might be a good way of managing uh, seed phrases, all right? Everything has its pros and cons. Uh, let's see. Okay, 3682 for AVAX, which is not bad. Thank you for that, Kenny. Um, let's see here. Yeah, AVAX. Uh, and it's up a little bit today. And so let's take a look at a 14 day chart if we can. Can we? We do. Can we see 14. Okay, well, let's look at the one month. Um, yeah, so um, the seven day. So, well, yeah, I guess it was up around 440. Uh, it peaked out at around 43. Um, has kind of just pulled back a little bit to do some consolidation. Um, I, do, I don't even see like a precipitous drop anywhere when that news came out, but it looks like it's, you know, it's hanging in there, right? It's, it hasn't gone back to its all-time high, but there were a lot of, this was February 15th, the all-time high, or at least in the, you know, for that, for the month. So we'll see, right? It's not dead yet. <laughs> I'm not dead. I'm not dead yet. Uh, thank you so much for all your insight and knowledge. I think BTC will continue to rise unless stock market crashes. Yeah, if we have a black swan event like uh, the COVID thing in, in March of 2020, people just sold everything, right? It didn't matter, you know? They sold everything. They, they even sold gold. Um, they just wanted cash. So people were liquidating everything, stocks, bonds, Bitcoin, crypto, gold, everything. So, yeah, if something, if we get another black swan event, who knows? Uh, let's see. I don't have anything planned as far as transfers go. Um, let me check here. I, I just, I, I was looking at this wallet earlier and I was trying to uh, think about uh, what we could transfer tonight. Um, we could move some Solana. Uh, so why don't we do that? I always want to do a little bit of crypto movement for you guys. Let me do a cash out. I think last week I was uh, trying to show you a cash out on uh, Bitcoin. And then I believe on Wednesday I was trying to show you guys a cash out and couldn't get through the entire process because Bitcoin is kind of slow. So let's do a Solana cash out. Um, because Solana moves pretty fast. So let's go into our Coinbase account. And uh, let me see if I can get back to, no, I can't. Err. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Brave, but it, um, I can't, there's certain things it won't let me do. All right. So when I click on this little icon up here, I expect it to pull down and give me the choice between Coinbase and Coinbase Advanced. When I do that in Brave, nothing happens. I just click on it, nothing. All right. Anyhow, that's maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just environmental. Let's go to regular Coinbase because it's more clear cut, easier to wrap your head around it. Right. What we want to do is we want to click send and receive and we want to choose receive. Right. And we're going to receive a crypto. So I'll click this pull down to choose the crypto I want to receive. I can type in Sol. Right. And there it is. 
and there's my Solana address for my Coinbase account. Let's click uh, to copy it into our clipboard. We'll go back over to our Coinbase or our uh, Ledger Live where we're managing Solana. Uh, we'll go into our Solana account, and what we want to do is ascend. All right? I'll paste in that address that I got from Coinbase. All right? We can double check it. Uh, whoops. I'll have to. Yeah. Well, there it is. Eric, thank you for that subscription. There's the Solana address, right? There it is again. Now, uh, it says account not funded. Now, I know uh, someone was asking me about, um, I forget what, near token, and it had a similar message. And it, it looks all scary because it's in orange. And it's kind of weird that it says that uh, because I have this Solana address has been the same uh, for years in my Coinbase account. I, whenever I send Solana my Coinbase account, they give me this address. So I'm assuming that there's a wallet somewhere hosted by Coinbase that has this address. But for some reason, when I tee, tee up the transaction in Ledger Live, it sees it as an empty account. Now, I don't know if that's because Coinbase ha is some sort of virtual wallet uh, or group wallet or, or something of that nature that makes my Ledger Live think that it's an empty wallet that has never been funded. Uh, there's this thing under the hood with Solana where you have to keep like a really small percentage of Solana in the wallet to activate it or whatever they call it. But this is just a warning. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's not going to work. So a lot of people see stuff like this and they just give up and they go, oh, what is that? Why can't I send my? Well, you can you can send your Solana. You just have to hit continue. That's all you got to do. Uh, but I know that's a little scary, but it's nothing to worry about. I really don't know why we get that. Um, now, uh, I just want to send like 100 bucks. Uh, hang on just a sec. We're going to do this here real quick. Yeah, we'll do 100, and we'll hit continue. And uh, I'm going to show you my device. So let me just move this camera in so you guys can see what I'm doing on my device. So this is the uh, key to crypto management when it comes to the Ledger device. Is that in order to send crypto out, I need to authorize on my device. So I always walk you through that, guys, so you can see me doing it every step of the way. We'll hit continue. It tells me to open the Solana app, which I'll do. Whoops. I need to move. OK. I need to click both buttons at the same time. So I'll click. Solana app is now open. And now I can authorize this transaction on my device. So it says transfer Sol. We'll click this button. We'll move over. Uh, there's that address again. I can look at it here. right? I can double check it one more time if I want to. There it is. Uh, let's go back here. And now I'll authorize it. I'll click over here. I'll click Approve. Hit both buttons. And off it goes. Um, you can view the details over here and view it on the blockchain. Uh, there's the Solana Explorer. It says it's successful. It's very fast, very quick. It might take it a few minutes to show up in my Coinbase account. But we're, that was it. We're done. But I, I told you I wanted to show you the cash out process. So I'm going to go through the rest of it. All right. Uh, we can dismiss this. Uh, we can go to My Assets. And you can see that's already in there, right? So what we want to do is trade. Uh, it's going to be kind of it. Let's see how much it's, they're going to charge me to do it. Uh, let's see. I want to sell my Solana. There it is. And I want to just sell it all. Uh, see, they're going to charge me $2.99 to sell it. Um, I'd rather not pay that much to sell it. So I'll trade it. 
So if we go uh, up here and we switch back to advanced Coinbase, we'll go to my portfolio. There's the Solana. If I click anywhere on this band, but not on the word Sol, but anywhere on this band, it takes me to the trading interface for that crypto. So what I want to do is sell my Solana, and then I'll just hit max, and that's only going to cost me 55 cents rather than 2.99 using advanced Coinbase. Um, the weird thing, oh, I should have used, oh, yeah, I use cash. So it went straight into cash. We can go over here. Uh, and now you can see that it's in cash, right? That was the U.S. dollar Sol pair. You, I'm f swapping Sol for U.S. dollar. Charged me 55 cents. I have $99.17. Now I want to go up here to withdraw, and I'm going to choose cash out, right? This is that, that uh, mysterious how do I cash out my crypto. This, this is the answer. You, you transfer it to your exchange, you swap it for dollars, and then you cash out to your bank, right? I like to shave the cents off. Sometimes when you're, you're doing something like you're cashing out and you use every available cent, sometimes the, the calculation is slightly off and they think you don't have enough. It'll say, oh, you don't have enough in there. So I shave the, the cents off personally, right? We'll hit continue. And I get to choose, I have several banks attached. I'm not in a huge hurry, and I want it to go in this bank, so I'm gonna choose my Lake Michigan Credit Union. It goes in in one to three business days, and it's totally free. All right, we'll hit continue. And I do this often enough to where it doesn't usually ask for my um, two-factor when I do this. It's a free cash out, $99 even. We'll hit cash out, and off it goes. Easy peasy. That's a cash out. It's going to show up in my bank uh, account, right? Most likely on Monday morning, right? Usually when I do this from Coinbase uh, around 9, uh, 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., it'll usually hit the account by the mid-afternoon, you know, like 2 or 3. Uh, when I do the free. Um, you can pay a little extra to do the automatic, or I'm sorry, the instant payment, um, and it'll show up anytime, anywhere. It can be 3 in the morning on a uh, Saturday night, and it'll show up in your bank balance right away. But if you're not in a hurry, then just choose the regular business day method. It's usually there in less than half a business day. Of course, when you do it on a Saturday night, you're not going to see it until Monday right. in your bank. Uh, I will never trust any company about managing my seed phrase. I will keep it to myself. Well, that's a good point, right? So even if we're going to use something like this, where uh, where did it go? Did I did I get rid of it already? I must have uh, navigated away from that. But yeah, you are basically trusting them, uh, even though it's offline. Uh, well, you know, if it's completely offline as they say it is, but. Whether or not it's totally open source, see that's the thing that people get into. You know, they they don't, they, you know, they they trust the car to get them from point A to point B. Um, they trust the bank, they trust the school to watch their kids for six hours. But when it comes to crypto, we're all skeptics. So it's like we don't trust anybody or anything if it's related to crypto. But I get that. I do. I get it. Uh, merely a flesh wound. Monty Python, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. That was 1975, if I'm not mistaken. And in 1975, I was 12. Um, my parents, we went to the movie theater and... I don't remember why we decided to go in to go see Monty Python and the Holy Grail because it was mid movie. We were it was like halfway into the movie must have been something we wanted to see was sold out or whatever. So my parents took me in to Monty Python and the Holy Grail when I was 12 years old and my life has never been the same since. <laughs> I was just like that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Oh, my God. Anyway, 
Enough about me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Drip. Good evening, Rex. I ended uh, delegation on Saul and Adam on Ledger Live. Are there any actions to be done once 21 days have expired? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. Uh, but it's my understanding in Ledger Live that after the unbonding period, the uh, it will be in your wallet. Um, but, you know, if it's not, it, it should be trivial to retrieve it. Uh, so after the unbonding period, just check your ledger live. And if your balance is not updated, then you might need to, to do what, whatever that last final step is. I've never used ledger live to stake Saul or Adam, so I'm not sure. Uh, and I've never, um, I've had my Adam staked in Kepler for so long, I don't even know what it's like to unbond it anymore. Um, but I'm pretty sure once you unbond it, you just have to wait for the unbonding period, and then it's available in your wallet. Pretty sure. Uh, Eric Garcia, can I have your opinion about the tangent? I think you mean tangent. Uh, I guess I'm curious because I'm interested in buying the and trading on PC, but I know that the tangent card isn't able to be used on PC. Yes, um, I like the tangent card. Um, Uh, I use my tangent card quite often. I've got three different tangent cards. Um, you can trade on the uh, tangent card um, using your app, but it is NFC uh, technology, which stands for near field communication. It is not compatible with a PC. Um, unless the piece there, there's some kind of NFC reader available for PC, but I don't think, I don't know that there's a market for such a device. There might be, I mean, with Tangem, uh, but Tangem only has a phone app. There's no desktop based app because uh, the idea of the Tangem is you have to hold your card up to authorize, right? Using, you know, using the NFC. Um, signal. So uh, you can't really hold your card up to the back of your PC to authorize transactions. So it really wouldn't make sense for them to have a PC version of this. Um, but you can swap crypto uh, on and you can manage multiple wallets, right? Um, and you can do swaps from within the app. Uh, and then uh, you authorize your swaps with your card. And I don't do a whole lot of trading on this app. The fees can be a bit high, um, but they had a special with Changely for a while there. Notice here that you can choose different providers, at least for this. Oh, that's an old uh, transaction. Let me see if I can. Okay, if I hit swap. Okay. Huh. Well, you used to be able to choose. I don't know. Uh, let me try this. Huh, okay. I could have sworn that there were some that were, they gave you two options, and I thought I had that there. Huh, okay. Let's see what happens when I do this. Oh, okay, okay, here, here, I'm sorry. I got a little confused there. After you decide how enter how much you want to swap, then down below you have that little, uh, it says change now. You can tap that and you can see that there are other services that you could choose from. Um, Changely, change now, and one inch depending on the crypto. So it's pretty flexible, but um, the the fees are a bit high in this interface, basically just for the convenience of being able to swap from within this wallet, which is pretty cool. And I'm I would be willing to pay that extra fee because of the convenience here. But I mean, for if I'm going to do go down and dirty and do real swaps and trades, I would prefer to do it on an exchange like Coinbase or Kraken, right? But I really love the fact that you can swap cryptos within this wallet. It's pretty cool. But I mean, if you're going to be doing some serious trading and like day trading and stuff like that, this is really not the platform to do that on, right? You should be doing it on some kind of trading platform. 
but this is a great wallet and it's very flexible and there's a little bit of overlap between you know the self custody of the wallet and the ability to do swaps which is really cool yeah but it's phone only yeah because of the nature of the card the the private key is stored on your card and it's uh NFC technology, near field communication. It's the same technology when you use Apple Pay with your phone. That's the same thing that's going on. You know, when you tap your phone to a payment terminal in a restaurant or ice cream shop or a coffee shop, that's NFC. That's near field communication. Yeah. Uh, that was some good info. I don't think I get the option to put in for free in Canada. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, Canada, beautiful. I, I've, I've only been to Canada once. I would like to go again. We live pretty close. We're in Michigan. We're going to ride up to the uh, Sault Ste. Marie um, on the winter break, but the, the weather was pretty bad. We're, we'll probably go there uh, in spring or summer. We've been to Trevor City and Marquette, and uh, we love Michigan. <laughs> uh, I wonder if we see a Ripcord algorithmic stablecoin this cycle. Not sure about that. Um, I would like to see, I mean, uh, I thought that the Tether, I'm sorry, the Terra Luna algorithmic stablecoin was a great idea, and uh, I thought that it was implemented pretty well, but as it turns out, it was kind of Ponzi-ish because there were so many people sort of piling into it that they were able to afford to pay a really high return. But that system was toppled uh, by some people with deep pockets, and if that's my opinion. Uh, some people that bought millions of dollars worth of UST and then dumped it on the market to, you know, depeg it from, uh, you know, it's it's U.S. dollar peg. Um, but uh, the idea of an algorithmic stablecoin uh, really didn't deserve to be, you know, uh, treated like that. I mean, it was a pretty good idea, if you ask me. Uh, math, you can do a lot of stuff with mathematics if it's implemented properly. I would like to see another algorithmic stablecoin. Uh, Arculus Card Company told me they have software that blocks any screen watching on smartphone while previewing seed on screen. I can't trust that hardware wallet is the best. Um, I have noticed that when I'm trying to, um, like I have this sh phone sharing software, uh, there are certain wallet apps that won't show on this screen um, and it's kind of, it kind of frustrates me when I'm trying to do demos but they do have that technology um, the you know uh, and I understand if you're not comfortable with that but the nature of an Arculus card and a tantrum card uh, the the only way they can implement you know the seed phrase option is on the phone app because the card itself has no display so I mean they got to figure out a way to do it somehow so if you're not comfortable with that then I guess don't use that solution but I understand why they do it that way that's the only way to get it done since there's no readout on the screen uh, let's see Cosmos going to get going soon question mark I'm hearing inflation is an issue and the memes and things are not using Cosmos I hadn't really followed Cosmos that much um, because I kind of uh, feel it's a set and forget for me. I don't have as much as I I would like to have, but um, I have some uh, Cosmos staked in my Kepler wallet, and I do like um, the Kepler wallet and the Cosmos ecosystem. Right? It's not just uh, Cosmos. If we and Dan will tell you, <laughs> he watched me flailing around with this. But it, I mean, it has a lot of flexibility and a lot of different coins that you can manage. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, great stuff happening on the Cosmos blockchain. Um, but I don't follow it on day to day. I just kind of set and forget on that pretty much.
but it's pretty decent. And I love using Kepler. And this wallet is protected by my Ledger device, right? All of these cryptos, the private key is on my Ledger device, right? So very safe and secure. Uh, let's see. Do you have a recommendation for a beginner hard wallet? I was thinking of using the Trezor Safe 3. Trezor Safe 3 is a pretty decent choice uh, because it's affordable and safe. Um, the only drawback to uh, Trezor is uh, they don't support a whole bunch of cryptos. Uh, but yeah, let's look at the Trezor Safe 3. It's only $79. But if we look at the Trezor Suite, you'll note that, and I don't think I can do this without the device attached, but this is pretty much, they, they just added Solana support. Um, but Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, XRP, Dogecoin, Cardano, and Solana, that's about it. There are some minor coins that they also support, like I forget what they are. Um, but they just don't have the multi-coin support that, you know, that I like. Um, it's a great wallet. Uh, the other alternative to the Trezor Safe 3 for a beginner you know, not too difficult to use wallet would, of course, be the Ledger Nano S Plus. Um, it's, it replaced the Ledger Nano S, has as much storage as the Ledger Nano X, has the same size screen. It's only $79. It just doesn't have the Bluetooth and the mobile compatibility. But for it's very similar to the Trezor Safe 3. I don't know where it went. Yeah. So same price, same functionality, right? Trezor Safe 3 is, is a pretty decent, cool wallet. If all you're storing is Bitcoin and Ethereum, you might kind of lean more towards the Trezor Safe 3, if that's your thing, right? Um, because of its ease of use, the, the buttons and the screen uh, a little bit easier to manipulate than the uh, Ledger Nano S, right? Um, l a little less intuitive, I would say, but much, 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 much more crypto support. Supports lots of crypto um, cryptocurrencies and third party wallets. So for flexibility, I would go with the Ledger Nano S Plus. But, you know, just for ease of use and, uh, you know, for that same price, you can get the Trezor Safe 3 if you're just interested in those major cryptos that it supports. Uh, a lot of people prefer Tangem over Ledger. Uh, like I said, I really love the Tangem, but it doesn't have that power and flexibility that I get from my Legend Nano X. So I will use both. I don't, don't feel like you have to choose a wallet and stick with it, right? You can use more than one wallet. You know, I've got four or five go-to wallets that I use. So don't feel like you have to choose one wallet, um, you know, um, especially if you're managing quite a bit of crypto it's best practice to maybe spread your assets around a little bit so that they're not all on one platform. Don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Birds, bees, and trees. Near field communication is a set of communication protocols that enables communication between two electronic devices over a distance of four centimeters or less. NFC offers low speed connection. What's really cool about NFC too, when it comes to like the tangent card, is that there's no battery in this thing. It doesn't need to be charged. It's like magic. Holds your private key. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's see. I'm big on Cosmos myself. It has all the fundamentals, but I'm hearing that token inflation is the biggest issue right now. Uh, we will get it figured out. Okay. I hadn't heard anything about uh, coin inflation on the Cosmos network. I'll have to check into that. Taking care of business. No Bitcoin only. Didn't your mother tell you not to gamble? <laughs> oh, interesting. I know, I know how dad likes small and volatile coins. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've been burned quite a bit by small and volatile coins. So um, I still, I, I mean, I like playing with them. 
and I like having the option of managing them. I like that flexibility, but I can't say I got rich, right? Well, you know, I, I had my moments, right? Uh, who is CoinCover? CoinCover is a, uh, I believe CoinCover is based in the UK, um, and they are the partner with Ledger um, that, that helps them implement their um, uh, recover service. Uh, now, I would never use the recover service, um, it's an optional service. The, the thing that bothers me about coin cover is, um, if I can find it here, uh, risks, no, 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 no. There is, th they, uh, in order to use this service, um, and it's not cheap, right? This is not, this is the coin cover. Uh, but they uh, use another service for um, biometric storage, right? So coin cover is a service, but they use, there's two other services that they use that specialize in biometric data and storage, right? So you scan your face into this system and it gets stored somewhere. And that's the part that creeps me out, right? So that's why I, because I, I always wondered when uh, Ledger was talking about this recover service, I was like, how do they verify that it's you when you do a restore on a brand new device? How do they know it's you? How do they verify that you are in fact the owner of that wallet that you have now lost and you're, you're restoring to a new device. Well, they use your biometrics uh, through this service and then these other companies. And I don't have them off the top of my head. I, I can't, well, maybe it would be in their FAQ if I can find it here. Uh... Uh, see, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to. I can never find this kind of stuff when I'm just shooting the breeze with you guys. But they use third-party companies for the the biometric services, right? The part that scans your biometrics and stores it you know, on their server somewhere, and that's the creepy part for me. That's why I would never use it. But the Ledger Recover service incorporates the services of Coin Cover. You asked, <laughs> what the fuck coin cover? Well, it's not a scam. Uh, I don't know, the, the, the scam is a loose, uh, it's more of a uh, insidious conspiracy to harvest your biometrics than it is a scam. <laughs> I, I think that, that thing go, it goes beyond scam. That's like a, a worldwide <laughs> insidious you know, evil conspiracy. I don't know. That's beyond scam. Scam is when someone lies to you to get your bank account or your seed phrase. This this goes way beyond scam. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, man. I wish I could. Rem oh God, I guess. Err. Uh, okay. Let's try this. Who does coin cover use for? Biometrics. Uh, ah, I'm never going to be able to find this. I knew. Uh, doggone it. Uh, come on, Rex. It's got to be in here somewhere. Uh, okay, maybe it's in here. Okay, I think we're getting there. Okay, they're, they're talking about IDV. Liveness checks. Um, who are these IDV providers? Uh, see, I, I'm not going to be able to find this. Uh, 
Let's try this. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I believe this is one of them. Okay, so these are the people that you store your biometrics with them, right? Ooh. I believe these are one of the people that are partnered with CoinCover and Ledger for the biometrics, the storage of your biometrics. I don't know. Uh, Trust Radius maybe sounds vaguely familiar. Um, yeah, no, nah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna lead me anywhere. Oh, okay, here we go. On Dotto, okay, I believe On Dotto was one. Oh, maybe not. This is more documents than it is biometrics. Yeah. Yeah. See? They're scanning your biometrics and, like, storing it with your personal data. Boom. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about that creeps me out about Ledger Recover. If, if you think Ledger Recover is a scam, this is the scammy part, although it goes beyond scam, right? It's like evil data, biometric data harvesting creeps. <laughs> right, way beyond the scam, right? Insidious evilness. Okay, enough about that. I still want to know where you served OPSEC. Okay, let's, uh, that's right, uh, taking care of business came in originally asking about anonymity, and so let's talk about anonymity a little bit. So uh, in order to be anonymous on the internet, uh, you need a combination of two things, or only one, it depends. Uh, the, the first is uh, Tor. You're kidding me, right? Uh, if you're using a to the Tor browser, your uh, your data is encrypted, right? Um, and so uh, instead of it coming, if someone tries to trace back where you're coming from, uh, they would have to, your data gets kind of moved through what uh, Tor, Tor routers or endpoints. And so uh, they can't really uh, track you or surveil you, right? So that's your first tool, right? But some people want to use Tor in conjunction with a VPN. So in other words, okay, I will connect with a VPN and then I will run my Tor browser or vice versa, I'll run my Tor browser and then from within that, I'll use a VPN to make it even harder to, f to find where I am and who I am, right? So there's, but there's a big difference between who you are and where you are, right? Uh, both of those can give you away. Right, so you your IP address gives away where you are, pretty much, and uh, even if you've obfuscated your IP address, if you're checking your Gmail, then uh, they'll know it's you, right? So you have to avoid, and that's just an extreme example, but you have to avoid. Uh, your regular patterns if you want to be anonymous, right? So the way that you speak, the, the, your grammar, when you're in message boards and you're typing uh, a post uh, of, that's a few paragraphs long, there are, there are AI software that can analyze uh, the author of text and that, and that can tie that to you. 
So you have to realize that it's one thing to be anonymous. It's one thing to use TORT to mask your IP address or encrypt your traffic. But you've got to also avoid doing things that uh, can leak your personal data, like checking your Gmail or visiting the websites you normally visit. You know, just your normal day-to-day -day patterns have to be avoided when you're using these kind of tools, right? So, and your location. So, if you're doing all this from your home, you may have a really good setup, but your IP, you know, IP transfers can be tracked. So, um, most People that are into anonymity and Tor and that kind of stuff will tell you don't do it from your own home. You need to take a laptop somewhere and do it from a coffee shop. But even that, um, there are license plate scanners that scan your license plate, the know your identity. Facial recognition could catch your face at a coffee shop, even if you're, you know, you know, you borrowed a laptop or you bought a laptop with cash at the 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 swap meet, and but and then you went to uh, a, a coffee shop with an anonymous email address, and your face got caught on uh, a webcam that has facial recognition, or you drove your car there, and then your license plate was scanned by the numerous license plate scanners that the, the police have all over the place. Uh, so they've just tied you to that location and that computer and that IP address, right? So it goes way beyond w using a cryptocurrency that you think you're anonymous by using Bitcoin. Or even if you're using Monero, you've got so many of these OPSEC things to keep in mind if you really want to be anonymous. It's, all, it's practically impossible to be anonymous in today's world, even if you're using Tor and a VPN, um, because there's so many things about you that can leak data. Like if you have your phone with you, we, we talked about that story about the text and the emails and the, uh, the text and the calls and the geolocation data was enough to reveal a lot of their uh, actions. You know, that didn't even include Google and Apple and, uh, you know, all that other stuff, right? So it's a very sticky subject. And I get a lot of people that ask me, like, how do I send crypto anonymously? But it's not that simple, right? Um, you know, uh, wear a, a hoodie and sunglasses and, uh, you know, a COVID mask and buy a computer with cash and, you know, go to a coffee shop and, you know, use Tor and a VPN. And I mean, it's just like it's so inconvenient. It's maybe not even worth the trouble if you're trying to be totally anonymous. And what is it that you're trying to achieve there? Are you trying to buy something? Uh, are you are you just you trying to make a trade without getting, uh, you know, the tax man involved? I mean, um, you're gonna it's somehow you're gonna need to pull something out of this that's useful for you. I'm assuming, right? If let's say you make that that killer trade anonymously and then you know you've got a hundred thousand dollar windfall, what are you gonna do with that money? I mean, how are you going to account for it, even if it's cash? Are you going to walk around and, you know, uh, buy, buy everything with cash so nobody will know that you got that money anonymous? I mean, it's just like uh, there's more to it than just sending crypto from point A to point B in an anonymous fashion. I know that's a start, but where, what are you trying to achieve with this so-called anonymity that you crave? That's my question. Uh, we are ducked. Free comes sometime at a price. I need to get a new laptop. <laughs> so your name is Jason Bourne. I had one time I didn't use it for a while, and I tried to enter the pin, but there was not enough charge to get the pin in. Screen went dead a few times and eventually worked. Okay. Uh, I don't have a computer capable of running Ledger Live. The, Na the Ledger Nano and Ledger Nano Plus are both mobile compatible just not wireless. I use both on my Android phone connected via OTG cables from Ledger. Uh, the, yes, you can use those devices with Androids if you have that, uh, that cable connection kit. 
Um, I think that uh, any C to C cable would work. Um, but yeah, it won't work with an iPhone. The, you can't connect a Ledger device to your iPhone. I mean, uh, the Ledger Nano X will do the trick, and it's only 150 bucks. Um, I, I know that's almost double the cost of a Ledger Nano S or a Ledger Nano S Plus. But, you know, um, if you don't have a computer, um, and if you don't have a computer that's capable of running Ledger Live, you can go to Best Buy and ask them for an open box laptop that's maybe a couple hundred bucks that will most likely run Ledger Live. Um, there's, there's a solution to every problem. <laughs> uh, what is the Bitcoin and what usually happens when that takes place? The Bitcoin halving is built into the Bitcoin code. Uh, every there's a certain number of blocks that have to be reached for this having to occur, um, and historically it basically occurs every four years. And the Bitcoin reward given to Bitcoin miners gets cut in half, and so um, Bitcoin becomes more scarce. That's a quick overview of it. Historically, Bitcoin uh, has gone up after the halving, but usually with a five to eight month delay. That's just historic. It doesn't mean it's going to happen again exactly like that, but that's what people are kind of looking forward to when they talk about the halving. Uh, the, the latest halving is coming soon, less than two months. And so, you know, you might want to do a little research about it. A lot of people claim that's the best time you need to buy now before it goes uh, ballistic again. Anyway. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate all the questions. Uh, I didn't move a whole bunch of crypto, uh, but we did have some lively discussions about a range of topics that involve crypto and security and updates. I want to thank everyone for being here. Kenny, thank you so much for being here tonight. As always, thank you for the news story. Thank you. Thank news stories, plural. Thank you, Dan and JDO, for being here tonight and moderating and helping me uh, deal with all of the questions coming in. Uh, thank you, Taking Care of Business, for being here early and being here through the entire uh, live stream. Um, a lot of people will come in uh, with a burst of questions and then disappear. So uh, thanks for hanging in there tonight. I appreciate it. Jen Crypto, thank you so much for that donation. MT, Asil, Joseph, thank you guys for donations tonight. I really appreciate it. Tom, as always, good to have you here. Thank you so much for your donation. Thank you, everyone that uh, came uh, again. Uh, a lot of regulars were here tonight. Uh, Scott, P. Wizzle, Zach, Amsterdam, Holland. I didn't see Joanne L. in here tonight. Maybe she, I said, oh, there she is. Hi, Joanne. You, your icon's slightly different tonight. I don't know how you pulled that one off. But yeah, uh, thanks for all the regulars being here. You guys uh, really motivate me to keep doing this every Saturday. Um, I, I sometimes I feel like I don't want to do it, but uh, I always think about you guys and uh, it puts me in the mood where I need to be. Uh, if you uh, don't forget, we'll do it again Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. Join me again for the live stream from Michigan where you can throw out questions and I'll do my very best to get them answered. I've also been doing a live stream every Wednesday uh, around 10 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. on Wednesdays, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so look out for that one, too. And uh, I'll post content periodically, standalone content. So keep your eyes open for that as well. If you want to subscribe, I would really appreciate it. You can uh, there's a little uh, clicker or a bell or whatever you can toggle when you subscribe that will alert you whenever I post new content. Um, once again, thanks for